This is a tutorial on solving polynomial inequalities. So in this video, I'm going to take you through an example where we figure out when is this polynomial less than or equal to negative 16. And it's an inequality specifically because we have this inequality symbol here. The question doesn't say when is it equal, it says when is it less than or equal to. So there's a couple strategies we can use when solving polynomial inequalities. Uh, one, we could solve it by graphing. Another, we could solve it using something called a factor table or sign chart. I'll take you through both methods. So before we begin, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure you do that right now so that you can easily access tutorials on you know any topic you're going to learn in high school math. So here we go. So step one, whenever solving a polynomial inequality, is moving all the terms to one side so that it says it's less than or greater than zero. So I'm going to start by moving this negative 16 to the other side. And we can just follow normal algebra rules when rearranging an equation. As long as you remember that if you ever multiply or divide by a negative number, you have to, re you have to reverse the inequality symbol. But in this case, I'm just adding 16 to both sides, so I don't have to reverse the inequality. It stays just like this. Let me fix that symbol a little bit, less than or equal to zero. So the reason why we do this is because now we're interested in when is this function less than or equal to zero. And that's going to have the same set of answers as when this function was less than or equal to negative 16. But this one's a lot easier to work with. Because if you think about it logically, now we're just interested in, well, this function, you know, this function's degree three negative leading coefficient. So I know it goes from two to four and it's degree three, so it could have two turning points in between with a y-intercept of 16. So it looks something like this. We're interested in when is it less than or equal to zero. So when is it below the x-axis? So I'd say in this interval and this interval. Now this graph isn't perfectly accurate, but you can see why having it set less than or equal to zero is useful because then we're just looking for when are the y values of the function less than or equal to zero. For what range of x values is this true? So in order to be able to graph this perfectly accurately, accurately, we're going to have to find what are these x-intercepts here, where the function switches from being positive to negative or vice versa. So if we want to find the x-intercepts, you know by now that we need to get this into factored form. So that's why step two is factoring the polynomial. So in factoring, step one should be always to check for a common factor. So I noticed that I could common factor out negative two from all of the terms, x cubed, plus 3x squared, uh, minus 6x, minus 8, less than or equal to 0. And now I'm interested in factoring what I have inside here further. Right? I want to get into fully factored form so I can find the x-intercepts. So it's four terms, so I would try grouping. But you'll notice grouping won't work with this. We wouldn't get a common binomial. So when that happens, you're going to have to test for zeros and do your synthetic or long division to get it into factored form. So I'm going to want to try and factor this further. I'm just going to call this f at x to keep my work organized. Now, we need to try and guess and check integers that could make this zero. And the only integers that could work, so I call these possible zeros, are factors of 8. So plus or minus 1, 2, 4, or 8. Those are the set of integers that could make this become 0. We just have to test until we find one that works. Um, if we plugged 1 in for x, you know, it, it wouldn't equal 0. If we, but if we plug negative 1 in for x, I would get negative 1 uh, plus 3 plus 6 minus 8. So that's 2, plus 6 is 8, minus 8 is 0. So I just figured out that f at negative 1 equals 0. So that tells me that x plus 1 is a factor of f at x. So I can, off to the side here, I can divide this polynomial here by x plus 1. And I'll use synthetic division. I think that's a little bit quicker. So I figured out negative 1 was the 0. The coefficients of the function are 1, 3, negative 6, negative 8. Do the synthetic division quickly. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. 3 plus negative 1 is 2. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Add, get negative 8 multiply, get 8, and there's my remainder of 0. So what I have here is my remainder, my x to the 0 term, my x to the 1 term, and my x to the 2 term that are in my quotient. So I can now factor this to negative 2, x plus 1, times my quotient, x squared plus 2x minus 8 with no remainder, less than or equal to 0. 
Now that it's in factored form, oh, I can factor this one further, right? This is a degree two polynomial, so it's a quadratic. I can factor that further if I can find numbers that multiply to negative eight and add to two, and those numbers do exist. They are four and negative two. So there we go. Now that's fully factored form, right? Each factor is degree one. Um, and I have this constant factor in front. I could divide that over, but then I'd have to reverse the inequality. So I'm just going to leave it just to keep this as straightforward as possible. So I know this function has x-intercepts at x equals negative 1, negative 4, and 2, right? Each of those values would make each each of those values would make this whole product become zero. So this tells me when it's equal to zero, but I want to know when is it less than or equal to zero. So we're going to use those x-intercepts as the dividing points either in our graph or in a factor table. So I'll show you both methods. So our graph, we know there's x-intercepts. I'll just roughly plot them at negative four, negative one, and two. And the function, remember, this is the factored form version of, so it's the factored form version of this function. So it had a y-intercept of 16. So let me just roughly plot that as well. I mean, the y-intercept isn't really useful uh, for this, but just to keep the graph as accurate as possible. And remember that function up there, we already talked about it. It was a negative leading coefficient and an odd degree. So we know that goes from Q2 to Q4. So I know it's going to go from here to here. And if you look at each of the factors, each of the factors was order one. So I know it's going to go straight through at each of the x-intercepts. So the function is going to look something like this. So that's a very rough sketch of what the function would look like. And now we're interested in explaining when is this function less than or equal to zero. So for what x values do the y values of the function go to zero or below. So we would be interested in this part of the function and also this part of the function. In those two intervals between x values of negative four, negative one, and between two and infinity, the y values of the function would be negative. So that's going to be the answer to our inequality. So now we can write our answer in two different ways. We could write it in bracket notation. So it's between negative four and negative one. So we want to describe our interval as saying, uh, the inequality is true when we have an x value that is an element of numbers between negative 4 and negative 1, including negative 4 and negative 1. That's why I have the square brackets. Or if we have an x value between 2 and infinity, including 2, round bracket at infinity, always a round bracket at infinity. Or we could write this as an inequality. We could say between negative 4 and negative 1, including those two. That's why there's the equal sign under or x is greater than or equal to 2. So hopefully you understand why this is the answer, right? These are the x values that make the original inequality true. These are the input values. So if I input a value into the original inequality that is within this interval or this interval, it'll make the inequality true. So let me give you a better graphical representation. So this is just a very rough graph. Let me show you what the Desmos graph looks like. So here's the same function graphed on Desmos. And you'll notice, uh, while I'm moving the slider here, just take a look at the point. So the point has the x value and the y value. So look between negative 4 and negative 1, and I'm talking about x values between negative 4 and negative 1, look at what the y values are. The y values are all negative. The y values are all negative between negative 4 and negative 1. But what about when we go to x values between negative 1 and 2? Well, the y values are all positive there, right? The function's above the x-axis. And then what about for x values bigger than 2? Well, all the y values are now negative. So the original question wants to know when is this function less than or equal to 0? So when are the y values negative? For what x values are the y values negative? For x values between negative 4 and 1, and also for x values bigger than 2. And now notice we included negative 4, negative 1, and 2 in our answer because the, fun the original question wants to know not only when is it less than 0, it also wants to include the times when it's equal to 0. So in our final answer, that's why we put square brackets in our bracket notation, or when we wrote it as inequalities, we put lines underneath. So now let me show you how we could get the exact same answer uh, using another method called a factor table or sign chart. And how does that work? Well, at the top of it, we put negative infinity on the left, we put infinity on the far right, and between it, what we do is we divide it up into intervals based on where the x-intercepts are. Well, we figured out the x-intercepts were at negative four, negative one, and two. 
So negative 4, negative 1, and 2. And basically what we're going to do, instead of actually graphing it and looking at the graph, we're just going to choose test points and plug those test points into the original equation and figure out are the y values positive or negative without actually having to look at the graph. So we're going to have to choose a test point within each interval. Uh, so I'm going to choose some test points in each of these intervals now. So between negative infinity and negative 4, I'll choose negative 5. But, you know, negative 10 would have worked as well. And between negative 4 and negative 1, I'm going to choose negative 2. Between negative 1 and 2, I'm going to choose 0. And between 2 and infinity, I'm going to choose 3. So these are all x values that we are going to input into the function and test whether the function is positive or negative. And when we test it in the function, we're going to do it in a bit of an organized way. We're going to test it in each of the factors separately. Instead of plugging it into the entire original uh, function and then evaluating it, it's actually easier if we plug it into each factor separately. Let me show you what I mean by that. So we put each of the factors down the side here. So negative 2 was a factor of our function. x plus 4 was a factor. x plus 1 was a factor. And x minus 2 is a factor. And now what we do is we test each of these numbers into each of these factors and then just record whether our result would be positive or negative. So, well, negative 2 is always negative. I could just complete that real quickly. But when negative 5 is plugged into x plus 4, I would get negative 5 plus 4, which is negative 1. When negative 5 is plugged into x plus 1, I would get negative 5 plus 1, which is negative 4. And negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7. So notice what we have figured out here is that each of the factors in this factored form equation here would become negative. So I would have a negative factor times a negative factor times a negative factor times a negative factor. An even amount of negative factors gives us an overall result of a positive function, meaning that it is bigger than zero at that point. So this is not part of our answer. Notice the function in that interval we just tested in the negative infinity to negative four, the function is positive. This part of the function all has positive y values. Well, how about between negative 4 and negative 1? How about this part? What are all these y values? So we test negative 2 into the function. And it makes this factor positive. It makes this factor negative. It makes this factor negative. An odd number of negative factors results in an overall function that is negative. And notice, yes, all the y values are negative there. How about 0? Positive positive negative we have two negative factors which results in a positive function and look the y values in that section are all positive test three positive 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 so we have one negative factor which means the original function has negative y values in that section so we just use the x-intercepts as the dividing points and then choose test values in each interval plug them into the factors of the original function and figure out the sign of the original function and notice how this table reveals the final answer to us the original question said, when is it less than or equal to zero? So when are the y values negative in these two intervals? So between negative four and negative one, and between two and infinity. So if we look at our final answer, that's exactly what we had here, between negative four and negative one, and two to infinity, and we included those values because there was an equal sign under the inequality in the original question. All right, so that's the end of this tutorial. Hopefully it helped. Make sure you go to jensenmath.ca if you haven't been there yet to get any uh, supporting materials and some extra practice questions. And also make sure you subscribe to the channel.